Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the introduction presentation, Jesus introduces the Developing My Loving Self assistance group from the Education in Love series, conducts a brief revision of what has been taught thus far, and presents a summary of the coming week. Recorded on the 21st of May, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Welcome this morning. Yeah, it's good, good to be with you for the, for the week. And what I'm going to do immediately is just start with a bit of a review about the, of the previous whole week that we had. So the title of this particular session is just an introduction to the week. And, and the very first thing we want to do is a bit of a review of the week itself. So, so of the previous week I'm talking about, not this, this coming week. We'll do that a bit later. So you remember the title of the previous uh, six days was Developing My Will to Love. And you could see from that, from that whole week how important your will is, isn't it? Like it's the, that gift that God has given you of free will is, is the most important thing for you to understand and be able to exercise. Now, in the presentation in that week, we examined a few basic principles that we needed to examine. And one of them in the first part of the session was what, what's, what's causing our resistance to change, what, our resistance to using our will to love. And remember, we examined three primary areas in that first session of looking at our uh, of, of how we're using our will. Can you remember what those three primary discussions were about? What was the first discussion about? If we go across to Therese. Thanks. Lack of faith. No, this, uh, that was in the second session. Therese. Oh, so sorry. if we're looking now at the first session, this is the session where we analysed things like we wanted to get educated from the source what what's preventing us from getting education from the source can you remember that yeah so if you come down to dave in front of you we've been educated by the world yeah so we have the world's view of love and remember we start, we wanted to analyze firstly what our view of love actually is and we've encouraged you to do that to actually analyze what your view of love actually is and that's one of the and, and in, in that discussion we saw that actually the most of most of us have our parents' view of love and not God's view of love. And this is a big problem for us. We need to release our view of love in order to accept God's view of love. And remember also, we're projecting at God how we feel about our parents. So most of us have not had a relationship with God, so we, we've never been treated badly by God or anything like that, and yet we think God's the bastard, right, and our parents are perfect. And it's actually quite often the other way around, right? But, but unfortunately, we, we have taken on the family view of love. And then we looked at, um, I don't know if you remember, but we looked at your resistance to change as well. And what was the dominant emotion that causes the resistance to change? What was that? Can you remember? If we come across to Louise. Um, fear. Fear. Fear, terror, actually, a big, big emotion. And we're going to spend a bit of time on that this week, this, that emotion, because that emotion dominates our life far more than most of us are aware. So we, we need to spend a bit more time on that emotion and looking at how we go about getting rid of that emotion or releasing that emotion from us, because that emotion is preventing most of our development in love. And then the next day we looked at how and why we remain in loving and it really got down to some a, a basic thing, one really basic thing. And what was that? Can you remember if we just come down to Karina in front? I want to. You want to, yeah. You want to be unloving. <laughs> like, and we excuse it and we justify it and we decide we're not going to develop faith and we decide we're going to reject the truth and we decide we're not going to feel emotions. And we do all of these, we're making these decisions every day of our lives and that's why we remain unloving. 
So it really gets down, it really got down to the fact that we're using our will to make a decision. And this is the very important thing we need to understand about our will. Our will is being exercised to make the decision to be unloving. And we need to change that if we are going to become loving people. We need to use our will to be loving rather than using our will to remain unloving. And that is basically a soul-based choice, a soul-based decision that needs to be made. All right. Then, uh, then we had the next two sessions, and this is where we talked about those four things that were problems that were causing us to remain in the state of being unloving. And remember what those four things were? Yeah. So you can yell them out. Let's just write them down as you go. So we got the lack of faith. Now, remember, we learned what about faith? Faith, everybody has a lack of it generally, but what did we learn about that? We can change it. We can change the lack of faith. We're resistive to having faith because it gives us a whole lot of outs. You know, it's a get out clause for being loving, right? By, oh, well, there's no such thing as God, or there's no such thing as God's laws, or, you know, in the long run, we're not going to be looked after if we do it that way. We have all these excuses which are all based upon our lack of faith in God's goodness. And, and that's something we can change, right? And something we need to work on to change if we're ever going to, to actually accept that, that we can change our unloving behaviour and make it loving. The other thing, the second thing was truth. So, so with truth, the importance of truth, honestly, it's the, it's the thing that leads you to love. It's the thing that leads you to freedom. And, and without it, there is no hope for us to become loving. No hope. And so truth is a very key part of our development process if we're going to become loving. We need to develop a love of truth. Most of us are petrified of truth, let's face it, and yet we need to develop a love of truth, a desire for truth. We need to seek truth. And we're not talking about just the truth about the universe and God and how everything works, but we're talking about the truth about ourselves. And this is the thing we're the most afraid of, the truth about ourselves. In fact, most of us, when we look at the truth externally, we're pretty happy to hear that. But when it comes to looking at the truth about ourselves, most of us are pretty unhappy. And, and, and it even gets worse than unhappy, doesn't it? Most of the time, I guess, we get into a rage about it. That's how bad it is. We're, we're so resistive, so fearful of finding out the truth about ourselves. Okay. Then the next thing was action. And there we learn that it's very, very important to understand how powerful taking action is in our lives. We're resistive to taking action because a whole heap of the next thing, emotion, may come up if we take action and it happens to be disapproved of or unaccepted by the world or so forth. And so our unwillingness to take action and our unwillingness to feel emotion, which is really humility, is it not? Our unwillingness to be humble. And these things are causing major problems for us to, in the sense of why we remain unloving. We're refusing to see our fear of those things. So we're refusing to see our fear of taking action. We're refusing to see our fear of emotion, our fear of being humble. We have a fear of being humble. We have a fear of taking action, particularly any action that is not approved of by others. Right? And we have a terrible resistance to truth, a fear of truth. We're terrified of it. Right? And we have no desire to develop faith because faith might motivate us to do all the other things. <laughs> And so we decide that the better thing to do is to doubt, be cynical, not take any action on the development of faith. How have you gone, how have you gone starting to develop those qualities? Get rid of the fear of, to those things. Most of you have probably just watched the videos again but still haven't worked on that, yes? Still, just slowly starting to work on that. Very important key parts to your development, things you'll need for the rest of your existence. So this is a beauty of learning things from God's perspective. 
is you need it for the rest of your life even after you leave earth right so this different different than other types of education like getting an education as a lawyer here on earth you know might be uh, not very useful in the spirit world but uh, getting an education about how God's laws work that's going to be useful for the rest of your existence these personal qualities these are personal qualities that that we need to choose to develop using our will we need to stop being afraid of developing them develop them and if we do that we we'll, and we learn how to do that now we it's going to stand us in good stead for the rest of our existence yeah. okay and then we examined um how to use our will lovingly you remember that what did we learn there we learnt a few things if we go to kill on this side if you leave your hand up again so that karen can see you yeah. uh, we learned to experiment okay so there was a very important thing that we need to do and that was to experiment and and something associated with experiment make mistakes <laughs> and remember we talked a little about our fear of making mistakes and why we have that fear really strong childhood fears we have of making mistakes god designed a universe where we're allowed to make mistakes and the only real mistake is a mistake in being unloving isn't it so that's the only real mistake mistake of knowledge there's no such thing from god's perspective really because a mistake in knowledge is is what god designed into the universe right all of us don't know everything and it's highly likely that all of us will never know everything right and we've got to get used to that and we've got to begin to enjoy that process right. okay and we also learned the difference between will and willpower, didn't we? Remember that? What what's the what what does willpower do for us? Well, most of the time it helps us suppress emotion. It actually the point of it is to suppress emotion. Whereas using our will from our soul means that we have to somehow develop an aspiration, develop something from within us, an aspiration where we actually change that comes from our soul rather than just from our intellect now to do that we've got to get rid of the things that oppose our development and obviously there's a lot of emotions particularly emotions surrounding fear that oppose our development and we got down to the fact that we could use our will but that was a choice that was a choice we're going to have to make for ourselves nobody else can force you into it and remember we talked about the difference between inspiration and aspiration many of you get inspired by others to use your will lovingly but you take that as that that inspiration away and what happens when you put in a situation and there's no inspiration we revert back to our unloving self and instead of just instead of still engaging the same principles no matter what happens and and what's the main reason why we do that again it's fear that's the main reason why we do that so these are things that we need to examine so if we go back up to Rick. would you say that faith is the key to overcoming the fear yes definitely definitely faith everything begins with faith from a human's perspective everything and this is why it's so important to work on the feelings you have about God. So important to work on your feelings about God. Yeah. And and honestly, your feelings about God, I'm still working on my feelings about God. And your feelings about God are going to until you become at one with God, that they are going to be the primary things that stop you from becoming at one with God, your feelings about God. Yeah because it was the very first sin if you like the very first thing that humankind did was walk away from god <laughs> naturally it's something in all humankind to have a lack of faith in god's goodness it's a very very important part of our process we'll, so we'll talk more about those four tools 
those four tools so important to our development for the rest of our existence it, and, it, and it matters not whether we're even imperfect or not after we've become at one with god those four tools <laughs> are still important to our progression so these are tools that we can use to firstly release sin and once we've released sin and we've got no sin there are tools that we're going to need to develop ourselves even further to to progress even further because everything is dependent upon the exercise of your will God can only help you do what you allow God to help you do. Okay, so that's a revision of where we're up to now at this point. We've, we've examined these particular things. Now, obviously, putting all those things into practice is, you know, a few years' work probably, right? And particularly when we've been so strongly using our will out of harmony with love, that, that is the case. We're going to have to spend our time examining our motivations and our reasons. And, and really, no one else, you know, while you can get help from others, no one else can really make you do that. That's something that only you can do for yourself. No one else can force you into doing that. Now, that brings us to our sessions now this week of what we're going to discuss. Now, the first thing I'd like to say is we're going to be using the term sin a bit this week. Let's define it again. What, what is sin? Let's define it. So if we come down to Barbens. Missing the mark of love. Right, so missing the mark of whose love? God's love. God's love. Okay, so, so the way God defines love to be, when I am in harmony with the way God's defined define love, love to be, I am now no longer a sinner. But until that time, I will continue to sin. I will continue to do things out of harmony with God's definition of love. Now, of course, that's a big problem, right? Because we have learnt man's definition of love, society's definition of love, and particularly family, our family's definition of love. And our family's definition of love from God's perspective has a lot of sin in it. And we're going around believing that, that we're doing the loving thing when frequently... From God's definition of love, we're doing the unloving thing. So, so we many times are ignorant sinners, you could say. We're ignorant of what's even going on a lot of the time. And we, we need to change that. We need to develop knowledge in that regard so that we can be less ignorant. And so there's something we need to do. All right, so we come to our sessions now. The first thing I'd like to say about our sessions is a general introduction is that you'll notice in all of your outlines I've added a, th a word called evil. Now, I, I'm still not happy with the word, right? <laughs> but this is what we're trying to learn about, right? And... And that's the world's definition of it. And I, th I thought there was no other way to really describe the world's definition of it. So you could call it, and this was a part of a discussion we had with a group of people, erroneous version of love. Uh, which is actually usually based around that motion of fear. Right? Fear determines most of our versions of love that we have on the planet. Now, the reason why we've done that is be, at the top of every outline, you notice there's the lessons in love that we need to learn. And then underneath that, there's the erroneous version of love listed as well for you. Right? And most of the outlines contain that lessons in love and the flip side of it, the erroneous versions of love, evil. Now, if I use the term evil from now on, if you can remember in your head, it's erroneous version of love, an error-based concept of love. Now, the reason why I really would like to come up with some unique word for it, you know, like I love the word sin because it, it defines uh, what it means to be out of harmony with God's version of love, right? So I, I love the version of uh, word sin because it's a three-letter word. You can say it in one syllable and it summarises everything to do with what's out of harmony with God's version of love. Now, really, evil is sin, is it not? Because it's out of harmony. It's out of harmony with God's version of love. 
So whenever we use the word sin, think about it as my erroneous version of love. What I think love to be and what love really is very different from each other. And I'm happy for you with all of those lessons of love when we come to our Q&As for you to ask about what, how was the lesson of love, that lesson of love involved in that particular presentation. Because I won't be covering them. They're there for your information only. But if you'd like to ask about them, I'm certainly happy to discuss them with you. You follow? Remember what we're doing is we're trying to, this is all about an education in love. So obviously, you know, learning what the right, the God's view of love and then learning what the world's view of love, the erroneous version of love is, is, is quite helpful, isn't it? We can contrast these particular things. Yeah. All right, so... What are we going to do this week? Well, this week we're, we've got basically three sessions, plan, th three sessions planned for you again. Three sessions, just like we had the first time. Each session, two days. This session that we're talking about now is about understanding our unloving self. So if we talk about understanding ourselves, and particularly, pardon me, the, our, the unloving part of ourselves, then there, we're going to cover a few facts in, this, pati in this, pati this particular two days. The first fact is how our sin, how, how, sorry, our pain got created. So we're going to discuss the creation of our pain. where it came from. So that'll be our next session. After that, we're going to discuss the creation of our facade. Why and how our facade gets created. Yep. So we're okay to there. And our third session is accepting the facade. Now, the problem with all of our introduction sessions in all of the Education in Love series is I could talk for 60 hours on each hour that we're presenting. So, so what we're trying to do is somehow summarise all that into a concise enough form for you to grasp the basic principles that we can then perhaps develop later. Because the reality is there's a lot involved in each subject. For instance, the creation of our pain, there's a lot involved in that. There's a lot involved in the creation of our facade. But what we're trying to do is shrink all of that information down into such a way that you can go away and feel like you know why you're in pain and feel like you know why you're, you, you decided to create this facade and how you were helped by society and your parents to create it and understand why that happened. And then even more importantly in this, these two days is coming to accept it as the way it is, coming to accept that this is what's happened to you. You see, most of you are judging what's happened to you rather than accepting what's happened to you. And you can't change something unless you go through a process of acceptance of that particular thing. You can't. And so we need to come to accept our facade, to enjoy seeing it in play, most of us feel shocked and judgmental and self-punishing and self-attacking when we see it happening, right? And we need to change that to, to get to a state of acceptance of it. And this is something we want to discuss with you over the next two days. How our pain came about, how our facade came about, and then just going through the process of enjoying the discovery of it. Because remember, the more you discover about it, the easier it's going to be to deconstruct. Yep. Okay, so that's our first two days. The next two days is about the removal process. So the next two days, we're going to be discussing removing our unloving self.
And here we're going to talk about some fairly important key things for you to be able to understand and grasp. The first thing that we're going to discuss with you is this concept of governing emotions. A group of emotions, very small group of emotions, that act as a major suppressant on your experience, your emotional experience, the ability of your soul to experience emotion. And we want to discuss these governing emotions clearly so that you can understand how, for the, for the majority of us, it's understanding, discovering and understanding and feeling these, these emotions, these governing emotions, will have a very large effect on our ability to then deconstruct the facade and release the pain. But without understanding the governing emotions, we will not ever probably release, deconstruct our facade or release our pain. We need to understand how these particular emotions, usually a very small group of emotions, have a large impact upon our lives and the more that we can release them, the, the more we can identify them and release them, the easier our life will become. So that's the first part of the second session. Then we're going to examine the deconstruction. of the facade, how do we go about doing that? What's the process? Now we've introduced you to the process in the 2014 presentations, but we're going to just, just talk more about that and try to give you more information about that. And then there's the release process of the pain. That's our that's our next discussion in those three days. They are the three, three primary <laughs> things that we'll be discussing. In my opinion, understanding the governing emotions part is going to be a key part for the majority of you to understand. We need to get a good grasp of that. And so it would be very good if... You have a good think about that the, in the morning before, you know, just have a look at the material, examine what questions you'd like to ask. It's a, some very simple concepts or ideas, but you need to see where it plays out in your life for you to truly understand how you can go about deconstructing facade and then finishing up releasing the pain. And then comes the favourite part of my... of the. Th this week, for me anyway, and maybe for you, you never know. And that is how, how to become my loving self. There's a, there's a lot of information in that section. Of our of our presentations and unfortunately like uh, I actually developed this program four times <laughs> in the last two months and I was never I was never happy about the program because there's so much information and I was trying to tr try to shrink so much information into a short you know series of presentations and and in this particular area it, it's a real struggle to be honest to cover the information that I would love to cover with you. And at some point, we're going to have to embellish this information in that two days further, uh, later, at some point later. But the main things we're going to examine is, firstly, what is the real self? Identifying the real self, understanding the real self, understanding God's creation of your soul, basically. That's what we're going to be trying to focus our attention on. Now, I'm not going to get too technical with that because there's a whole lot of what you'd call mathematical and scientific technicalities we could discuss in that area. We're going to do it more from the perspective of love and d different qualities that God has created as a part of each of you individually. Right? And we want to examine that just as an introductory process so that you understand what part of you is the real you. Yeah. Then we want to look at God's gifts, the, th the things that God's given you to develop your real self lovingly. 
There's a, whole, there's a number of things that God has been built in you to assist this process of development of you in terms of becoming a loving individual. And there's also a number of laws that God has made specifically just for your soul. And in fact, the very highest laws of the universe have been made specifically only for the human soul. And if the human soul never was created, then there's a whole series of laws that would never have been created either. Right? So God, God created specific laws just for you, just to help you. Right? And what I love about most of these laws, um, very few of them are punitive or what I would classify as, as corrective in many ways. Most of them only have positive outcomes if you understand them and engage them. Right? So that's interesting too. The laws that God designed to control the human soul primarily have been designed for your happiness and joy, not, not, not for your punishment and pain. Right? And, and so because on earth we engage a lot of pain, it, it's difficult for us to understand that sometimes. But this is something we'll be covering or introducing to you, this group, and then we'll be spending a lot more time on that the next group when we talk about understanding God's loving laws. So God's given us a whole heap of gifts. We need to understand those gifts. And then we, we want to discuss with you the wi using your will to become loving. Like what do you do? What, what are the things you need to develop inside of you, the personal tools you need to become more loving? So there's a whole heap of gifts God's given you and then there's a whole heap of personal things, personal requirements, you could call them, personal qualities that you need to develop. And what are they? What are the qualities you need to develop that will help you be loving? Well, obviously the four <laughs> is going to be part of it, isn't it? But there's others too that we want to talk about with you as well so yeah and then we want to look at this choice we have like the choice we have to be our loving selves versus being our unloving self because it is a choice it's not it's not something that's automatic most of us have this sort of concept in human frailty you know this belief in the concept that god made us to sin and, and this comes from a lot of Christian, 2,000 years, in fact, of Christian belief systems. And even before then, there was this concept that God created, if God exists at all, God created a flawed system. And we're just flawed humanity. And that's not the case at all. The flaws in humanity were created by humanity. They being our creations, only we can remove them. God will not choose to remove what we have created because you can see that then God would be working against our will. We need to learn how to remove what we have created, collectively and individually. That's what we need to do. So we need to discuss that, the choice, the personal choice, the personal decisions that we it's personal choices and decisions that we need to make. Right. So that's what we we're looking at in the last day of our of this group. So that sound sound all right with what with you? That's what we're going to discuss. Yeah. You know, uh, in the first century, um, there's not much said about my life from. Well, there's very little said about my life after 31 years of age, except for that moment in, when I was 12, apparently, where I went to the temple, which actually happened when I was 13. But anyway, um, the, there's not much else said about my life. But during those silent, that silent, <laughs> where the Bible was silent, that silent period of my life, obviously, I did a lot of things. And uh, one of the things that I did was... I came to see that if I w was ever going to help, be able to help another person, the first person I needed to help was myself. Now, you can understand that principle. Every time you fly on an aeroplane, that's reminded, you're reminded of that, aren't you? 
with regard to if you have a child and you, and you know the air stops there and you need to get that mask on put your mask on first then help help your child and and i realized that if i was going to be able to be instrumental in allowing god to heal others through me i first needed to allow god to heal me you understand that right so many people have asked me in this life why are why am i not doing performing miracles ah the very first thing i have to do is what i have to first allow god to heal me I can't perform miracles, and you can't either, until you allow God to heal you. And by the way, you can never perform miracles because it's only God's love that performs miracles. God's love flowing through you will enable the miracles to occur. But the only way that is going to happen is by you first allowing God to heal you. You could say that this week is all about you allowing God to heal you. Make sense? Or at least introducing you to that concept of allowing God to heal you. So why are we covering this material? Well, obviously, we need to understand how to allow God to heal us, how to allow God to communicate with us, how to allow God to educate us. We need to understand that. We need to understand that the majority of our choices and decisions do not allow God to do those things for us. And so we are left alone because of our choice to be alone. We are left alone. We don't understand. Many of us think we're asking for God's help all the day, all, all the time, but the reality is we're not because we have emotions which are soul-based choices being made inside of us that prevent God from being able to heal us at any moment. And this is something we need to come to understand more fully, how we, through our choice, are blocking the flow of God's love into our own soul. And remember, it's only the flow of God's love that will finish up educating us. And it's only the flow of God's love that will heal us. And it's only the flow of God's love that will enable us to assist others. So without it, we are going to be as we are. Without God's love touching our soul and entering our soul, we are going to be as we are now for the rest of our existence, not just now but after we've passed. Unless we change, now what, what most do is they develop their love naturally, just like a child learns to walk. If you don't develop your love naturally here on earth, then the spirit world has been constructed in such a way with the laws of God to, to motivate you into developing your love naturally. And most take that path. Most take the path of developing their love naturally. But few take the path of allowing God to change their soul, change the love that's inside of them, transform them. Few take that path. And the reason why few take that path is going to be identified for you this week. And it's basically the decisions that we're making to remain alone in our progression rather than allowing God to change us. You follow? That is the decisions, the choices, the will, the way, the way we're using our will is the thing that's forcing us to do it alone. So this week we'd like to focus your attention on how, and, and like I said, we're just introducing the concept, but we're trying to focus your attention on how to go about allowing God to transform you by firstly choosing to get rid of all the things that we created that God had nothing to do with creating. Yeah. 
Now, we'll be developing those subjects further, probably not next year, but the year later when we talk about sin. Firstly, identifying and understanding sin, and then the removing of the removal of sin, which will probably be at this stage be discussed sometime in 2018. It sounds a long way away. But um, honestly, we need to first understand this principle of will, the principle of how to develop ourselves from be, being the unloving self to being the loving self. And then we need to understand some of God's laws and how they interplay before we can understand how to remove sin properly. And we need to put those things into practice in order to progress. All right, so that's our plan for the week. And that's and you can see the reason why we need to do it. One thing, so one thing I realized, and even now, in early in my life now, you know, well, early I say, but it's probably twenty something years ago, I realized that I can't help anybody unless I firstly learn how to allow God to help me. And that's a very important thing to understand, learning how to allow God to help you. And what's going on inside of me that causes me to reject God's help? The other things I need to understand. And so hopefully what we try, we'll try to do this week is help you understand those kind of things. What's going on inside of you, the choices you're making that prevent God from assisting you in some way. Because God wants to. Because God's good. Much better parent than any of us can understand, really. Even the very highest spirits in the celestial heavens still have no understanding of how good God is. And when, once, we, once we have some faith in that, and we realize that God wants to do, God is trying to do, God is already doing everything God needs to do to help you, then you realize how much I'm resisting it, don't we? We realize how much, there's, how much must be going on inside of me causing this resistance. Now, what we need to do, as I've pointed out, is not judge that, not condemn ourselves for that, but rather fix it. You can spend all your time judging it, you can spend all your time attacking yourself for it and, or attacking others for it and blaming this and blaming that person for it or you know, punishing yourself for it. But at the end of the day, all of those actions, besides being unloving, are all not going to assist you address the problem. And that's why we need to understand ourselves better and to accept ourselves. So many of you would have come along thinking that you know <clears throat> this week might be a bit intense my feelings are we want to get you to the stage of enjoying the process of self-awareness that'd be great wouldn't it so instead of going no no don't tell me more don't tell me more you know it's like don't tell me more what we're doing instead is we're going yes I would like to know more about what's going on. What, because everything I learn, everything I come to know, will automatically open me up further to allowing God to educate me. So there's benefits immediately to my knowing, to my absorbing this information. And to me, that's why it's the most important thing you'll ever do. It's also, to me, the reason why once you begin this process of really connecting with God, you'll feel driven to help others do the same thing. You will. You won't be able to help yourself. And if you can help yourself, then I suggest you haven't received enough of God's love yet. Because once, once you've received enough of it, you just can't help yourself. You, you want to help others go through the same process because you can feel the benefits to your happiness and your joy, the reduction of your pain, the enjoyment of your life and so forth. These things are natural consequences of us having that understanding of our relationship with God. And what we're trying to do this week, 
is understand all the reasons why we're blocking our relationship with God, why we're shutting down that relationship with God. Now, it can be fun to find out why, or you can turn it into a terrible trauma. It's up to you, because you have your will. It's up to you how you respond to it, to the process. Now, some of the things you will feel bad about, I agree, you will. Particularly the things that you know you've engaged that have harmed others and yourself, you, you will feel bad about these things. But honestly, it's a relief to feel them than it is to deny, and it's a lot harder to deny them, hold on to them, and have them affect the rest of your life. Right. So, so this is why we need to make these particular adjustments and changes, and this is why we need to examine ourselves more fully. So hopefully this week we'll be encouraging you to examine yourself more fully, to enjoy the process of self-examination, to see that nothing can really change. You can't really help others unless you help yourself first. You can't really help, help others understand God's truth even unless you've absorbed some of it yourself and unless you've lived it in your life yourself. You can't help others. And all of these benefits that come from this are all to do with your desire, your will being exercised to change from still being unloving, still being unloving, still acting unlovingly, still treating others unloving, still treating yourself unlovingly, to actually being loving with yourself, loving with others, and beginning to enjoy and allow God to transform you and enjoy this process of transformation, which is a very emotional process. And after a while, you, you love your emotions. So you'll be crying, but you'll be loving it. You'll be happy one moment, you'll be crying another, but you'll be loving your life. Right? And until all the pain is out, you'll have tears to cry. You will, till all the pain is out. Once all the pain is out, things get easier. And one other benefit is you've now learned to use your will, even in the most adverse circumstances. And you imagine that. If you've learned to use your will in the adverse circumstances, when things are easier, how, is it, how are you going to find the use of your will then? Isn't it just going to be joy to use your will? And that's how it is for any person who becomes at one with God. All right, so that's uh, our topics for this week. What we'll do now is we'll have a 10-minute break if we come back at 11.30 and we'll get started on the very first subject, which is about understanding the creation of our pain.